All right, hello everyone. We have learned a lot of wonderful mices and come to the last session. It gave a nice name, material synthesis. And uh, this is, it continues and also some different theme because we will start to talk about neural networks, which may be the eye-catching word. You will be interested to see what have new development here to use new networks, especially deep learning for material sense. But within this half an hour, it's too limited time. We can only touch the skin of it. But I'm very happy to share the journey with you. We can further develop more and more wonderful methods using new networks and deep learning for material synthesis. Specifically here, I put how we use the new networks and deep learning to elucidate chemical reactions. So I come from the background of chemical engineering. My name is Xiao Nan Wang, currently assistant professor at NUS in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. So we have a research group called Smart System Engineering. I have my PhD students working on all wonderful topics before applying optimization, data analytics, and the machine learning methods. And suddenly they realized we were doing the AI work because before we have done a lot of optimization, a lot of computing in all different ways combining the tools. And now we are building a smart nation with all those AI methods. You, you have seen that even the regression, it can provide you a lot of insights to make human intelligent. But these are not new methods. What I delivered the first message that we have learned a lot of methods. Everyone can do the machine learning, can do the AI. Even the neural networks, it's just very handy. When, after the workshop, we hope we can continue to use these tools for our future research. I do materials, I do energy systems, and even biomedical. So all the things, we can get wonderful discoveries using the methodologies, using the computer-aided tools. OK, so for my case study today, I will show you. It's mainly about the chemical reactions. So we deal with chemical reactions a lot in chemical engineering science and also material synthesis. We know that we, we, if we just want to get the, the final, like the, uh, get the synthesis, it's sometimes a lot of unknown factors, unknown recipes here. We don't know how to cook this material. And especially many processes, they are very far away from equilibrium. So first principle models are not available there. In this case, sometimes we would like to switch to some of the black box models. So machine learning itself will provide us those data-driven empirical models based on what we can observe, what we can censor from the process to build up this model. Especially now when we go to the nanoscale materials, it's really an unknown world. A lot of these things, for example, we are doing some case study in the nanocluster synthesis. No one can, no physical rules can explain how it happened to do this. We know how some, some secret recipes to get the final product, but no one can do a consistent cooking process. Once they identify one way, it's a very successful paper. But with all the published paper, can we get some rule from here? That's the, that's the one we want to use the AI. We, don't, we want to use the AI to analyze all the published data, even the failure experiments, combined with our daily experiment work to see if we can use this to get some insights into that. OK, so that's a question to be solved. Before I go to example, I show you an overview of the machine learning methods we have seen a lot today. So it's, it's definitely just one touch of the, of the whole island. So you see, we mainly categorize the machine learning methods to three big categories. So today we mainly talk about the supervised learning. So for supervised learning, we talk about how you classify different categories or how you do regression. So those things are all supervised learning we heavily used in, in mainly in, in a lot, especially in now deep learning ground and also in the materials field. But the unsupervised learning is also another category that can be used for anomaly detection, for the process monitoring, and fault detection. And these things just, instead of the regression, the classification in supervised learning, unsupervised learning will just have the X, a lot of these X to group them together, like do a clustering, instead of to find the Y relationship to X. We just do the X, collect the data, and see what's the in inherent trend, inherent clusters of the data. So that's the unsupervised learning. It's also very useful if you want to analyze your big data site. And also another category that calls more and more attention is called reinforcement learning. So this RL is exactly what the AlphaGo, those things now, they achieve very good performance because they can do the agent environment interaction. So in our materials, since now we analyze data, so we mainly use the supervised or unsupervised learning. But if we want to have a robot to do the experiment, 
we can then have this robot to interact with our real experiment system. This kind of interaction to deal with this agent or just certain uh, system and this whole environment is defined as reinforced learning. So if we have follow-up workshops, we, we may introduce more about those interesting devices combining all the methods. But this time, we just focus on heavily on the supervised learning as well, also to give you the case studies. So neural networks is a key category within the supervised learning. So you heard of the word neural networks, think it's something new, but it's now, it has been there for 30, 40 years, and we have used it a lot. Just now it becomes very useful just because of the increasing power of the computing resources. And how we do this, this is the interesting way to use neural network because this is exactly to give computer the way as human thinking. So how human process information, it's just like you have all your input signals into that, then your neurons, we have millions of neurons in our brain, the neuron will just process the information, combine linear combination or then do some activation. So those inherent laws are, are not fully clear, but it's basically this kind of signal processing. And then neural networks, this algorithm, is just to use computer, use mathematical formulations to simulate this process. So you see, you got the signal in, then for a single neural, it will sum all those new input from x i, x1 to x i with this weighting w before. So it's like a linear combination, but we don't do the linear thinking. So we sometimes add this, for each neuron, we add a bias term here. So it's a very simple first step to add all the input together. And then we have this function output. We need the activation function to make the decision. So either to accept this or not, to make a linear classification, or we have some specific type of activation function. So this is the whole process of a single neuron works. And when we expand this one single neuron to more, if we connect, because in brain we have tons of neurons, we combine them together to make this neural network, it will be powerful to, for decision making. So a basic one is a fade forward neural network. We have the input and connect it to the next layer. And just by this layer by layer structure, we have a very deep thinking process. So this information becomes re more closer to how human processes information. So this is a fully connected nonlinear system. And now more advanced for imaging processing is called CNN, convolutional neural network. This is it's even more just algorithm can deal with a lot of this video or image processing because for image we have very rich information. We can get the pixel information from all the image and then using this several steps, do some pooling, some, some all different steps can, can get the final output to be very exact to get the output information. So it's, we won't touch the CNN today, but I will show you some, give, give some take home examples you can play with. And lastly, we have a very nice tool called recurrent neural network. So it's also a neural network type, but it's very good to deal with time series or sequential data, because instead of this linear, uh, not linear, it's layer by layer structure, we're able to add another time series into it. So this time will add this iterative component to train the neural network. You can have a lot of forecasting or long short term memory. So these nice features make this RNN to be very interesting to have a memory of the history and it have a forecasting capacity as well. So this is all different kind of neural network. And why do we need to use the deep learning? So deep learning becomes a very popular word now. But if you are familiar with the neural networks, then you very basic way you add more and more layers. So I'm just kidding. If you have more than seven layers, you got a deep learning model. But it actually it has a lot of things to within. So you need to deal with these deep learning models. But by definition, it just means multiple several layers of nodes between the input and the output. And it performs very well generally just on image, speech, and other methods. But why does it happen? Because this one simulates human brain in a more exact way. Because we normally when we process information, it's multi-layer through these neurons. These neurons are connected to each other and get the connected layers to final output the signal. So I will use some slides to introduce the mathematical laws, but these are general information, don't have to remember this, it just give you background information, what does this neural network build up. So we call it multi-layer perception, it's a similar one as we see one single neuron, it just connects all these neurons 
by, by layer, and still we have the input to be x, and then add all those for each of the next layer, it will connect to the previous layer, so it's a fully connected dense network. And then still the same operation, just use the summation of the weighting w multiplied by x, and then add your bios. The only difference is because we have multi-layers, so we do this again and again to add, connect all the neurons together, to connect all the layers together. And then for the final output layer, we have an activation function. After all the processing in previous layers, we have the final one to have an activation function to get the final output. So what's the final output here is we need this activation function. So some specific types of activation function we need to define our commonly selected ones, like we use a tangent function, a redo function, which just looks like this, to be ramped function. So this kind of function are commonly proved to, to perform not, normally quite well for the new network performance. So after you got the, the final output with a weighted plus bias, then you take this activation function, then it will decide to turn this infinity horizon to this change the zero to one final output. Then you can do a classification of zero or one, or you can do a regression. You can decide this point is fired out or accept this point. So it's all different types of activation function you can use. So this is basically how the neural networks, neural networks play a role in the algorithm. But the key thing, when you want to get a very good performer of neural networks, you need to train a lot of multi-parameters. That's how when your projects come to a stage, it becomes a training process. The primate hyperparameters in the neural networks are extensive amounts, like the, all the weightings, all the W parameters, and all the layers. How many layers should I choose? And uh, how many epochs should, will I need, just like the iteration, to train the neural network? Because you need to use certain gradient descent methods, Chen Xiao introduced earlier, how you can get to the final optimum point to make the loss function minimized. So those parameters, hyperparameters, need to be tuned to get the optimal performed neural networks. So this tuning takes a long time. That's how we need computing resources to get the good performance. Also, what algorithm should, should I use? What activation function should I use? All those things are human decision. You, need, as, you as a decision maker, as a programmer, should, should do the process. But it's now, luckily, we have a lot of auto-machine learning methods. I can show some websites later. So the, even, even they got another AI to do the AI. So this, this kind of process is also automated. So this is the overview of the deep learning model. Then let's go to the real example. So it's, it's still this example to quickly show you, to, to let you be able to use the neural networks. But the first one is very complex chemical reactions, as I listed here. So this one, sorry, wait, we use. <laughs> it's a good signal. <laughs> I, I, I. So it's a complex chemical reactions. We have the series of reactions together with the parallel reactions. So this, this is defined as Debian reaction. This is very complex that we don't know the, the, the if we don't know how it happens, then can we have a model, a new network model to describe what's the output input relationship. But in this case, because we, we this model has been well, this reaction system has been well studied. So we're lucky to get some kinetic model. That's how we have our real data set. So we can compare our model generated data with our actual data to show the model's performance. Therefore, you get the confidence to say this new networks model really help to give you the, the physical loss. Okay? So for this model, we just took, in order to show you, just use simple input. So this can be the initial conditions of the environmental conditions, like CA0 is a concentration for A, T is a time, how, how long the reaction system happening there, and the T is a temperature as a, as to, indicate, to just represent the uh, experiment conditions. So this, this three input is to the reaction system and also used to train our deep neural network. And our output is here, it's just we want to get understanding of all the concentration of my output chemicals. So here from ARSTU, so all the product intermediates or the byproducts. 
So imagine this, com this is quite complex reaction, and then we want to create this black box. Let's just start with the dense neural networks, which is just feed forward or F and, and just a feed forward neural network to have all this information there. And the procedures is listed here, and it's also the same. It's, it's consistent with the code. We can later see it. So how we do that is here we have the set of the random generated conditions as the input for the three parameters. So when you write the code in, in your Excel or TXT file, it's just the three columns of all the terms. So here we call it features to set to fit into a system. Or in materials language, we can call it materials descriptors if it's to describe the, the, the whole process. But it's really in, incorporated a lot of the environmental conditions here as well. So we input these, prime, these parameters into the algorithm to train the model. But to train the model, we, we, we need the known the, the data set correspondingly for the labeled Y. So these are all labels. All the other five columns are the labeled Y output. So this is your data set. If we want to use this model, use new networks, you need to have your known data set prepared in this clear form. So it's always the first step to get your data set prepared. And then we are able to train this model. It's a lot of tuning process back and forth to get the best performance model you're satisfied with. And then recall in the first talk Qin Xiao gave, we have the inverse design, which is the most important thing to really help our experimental list. Because if we got a good model, it just doesn't do anything. You can tell some insights, but still we have some error there. We have not the perfect model. The key thing is that we hope to use the model to help us accelerate the materials development, to help us design the experiment. So here we can also use the first, like the, the inverse sense will still remember optimization methods, the particle swarm, this heuristic optimization. But here just to show you a basic example, if you don't want to go too complex, you can just check the final data because you got the model. You can use this model to generate a, a, a lot of this new data to give you some insights about how this system will work. And then based on this new data set, you can pick some points. Even using Excel, you can pick some points that satisfies your goal. So this is what I want to show you the whole process. So this is really we hope to improve the whole, material, the whole experiment design process. So then this, we can, based on this, we can then uh, move to our uh, code as well. But I want to show you the steps still as I introduced. The first step, first step is about data. So we need to prepare your own data. So I can, you can just write in Excel and read data from Excel. And then load the data into Python. Like we, we show a lot how to load data to, through Jupyter. But now I will show you another platform. It's just user interface, IDE environment, more similar to MATLAB many of us have used before. So we can then just use this Python to load this data and save both the training data site at the featured label as well. And next step is to create the model, to create the class and then train and test to have confidence that my model is satisfactory. And the final step is the inverse design to help us to generate new data and evaluate this new data to help us design the experiment. Okay, so I have the uh, codes on the slides here, but I think it's better we move to the, to the environment, to the coding environment, so we can quickly see it. Previously, we used Jupyter because it's very good for tutorial, for teaching, and you can directly see your results. And now I introduce you to this called Spider. Doesn't look very good, but it's a very nice IDE for development. You just launch it because I have it launched here already. So I should close this and uh, start with you. So again, you are in the workshop environment, if you see that. I think some question earlier asked if I can use this in my own environment. Of course, we give you the workshop environment because we ask you to get to preload all the packages we will use in today's tutorial already. So if you want to use some other, other environment, you need to install those necessary packages, like the Keras, those things we use at uh, sklearn. Okay. So when you open it, it's kind of like should be blank, right? It's in my, I have some code before, so it, but it's just, if you just open it from scratch, it should show you this interface you've got here. Okay, we have technical support whenever you need, just raise your hand. 
And this is a, like, look familiar if you use MATLAB before. So this gives you the interface to show the code, and this gives you the console to show the results. Okay. Here we have the file explorer, if you can see this. I can move this to the left a little bit. And under this file explorer, because we have already saved the workshop demo here, so you can go to the example directly. So this example is under neural network. Okay? So we have a lot of backup examples. <laughs> so you are able to get here. And here is the one I want to show you called the main presentation script under new network. This is a DNN I will show you. So this is a Python code. We just write them together in a single script under neural networks, and it's a dot .py is a Python file, main presentation script dot .py. Able to see this? So it's very similar structure as we use the uh, Jupyter Notebook, but we just write all the imports, all the things together, and then we can read the reaction data. Sometimes I prefer to use this way because then you know clearly where you read your data and then you can see your file explorer as well because when you see someone ask how do I find my, how do I ch use my own data? So if you see this loader Excel, it's just to load your data from this directory. We have a folder called Excel and we have the folder called data loader. And then this data loader here is my input data. So then you, you can, if you want to use your own data, you just fit your data into the Excel field and can try with that. Because this is my, I only consider my data to be the three column of input and the five column of output. So in machine learning, we call these features and we call these labels, right? So these, these are things you can change. If you have other X, other Y, you can just change in, in the Excel. But here we want to show you using this data loader how we do this. Okay, so if you read this Python code, you, you then got the data loader, you read your, your data. And the next step is to create your new network model. It, this one is very, very important. It seems just one simple line to define the parameters, but this will decide how good your model will be. So normally, if you just do a simple case, you use the default value, but it's allow you to see the hidden layers, means how many layers you have in your deep neural networks, and how many nodes you have on your each layer, and the epochs, how many iterations, is like training process, and the batch size as well. Because you need to find your your ideal parameter to find your gradient descent optimum. So those are the hyperparameters. You can read some tutorial about neural networks to see what these parameters mean and activation function here. But if you use default value, you can still get results not that bad. But these parameters need a lot of tuning if you really want to do very good model. And then it's a you define the new network class with the parameters defined. And because one important thing, here I, I didn't pull out too much because I only care about the MSE, mean square error, for this regression. I want to get as small as possible so, so to see if my, my model is good. So I only print this. But you can have a lot of plot function here as well. Just add another plot. So by now, it is a model process. The rest part is how we use the model. So let's just play the model now. So now we don't have to press a lot shift enter. You can just, because it's all written together, you can still run step by step, but you can also just click the run or F5 to run the file. And you will see in your console. This, because we use the TensorFlow for for the, the methods environment. So you can see it load this TensorFlow package and it will start to run. Right. It should be able to run on your machine. If you have any errors, maybe the, the package are not installed correctly. But this is how we say this. This one is quick because we only allow it to run 100 epochs. Just 
use 100 iterations to tune the hyperparameter. But the model is quite good already because this, this data is very clean and it's very good data size. So we got the MSE to, on the test data side, it's only points, like, like less than 0.1, percent So it's quite good, satisfied with this. But you can further train your model if you need. Okay, so this is the first, we generated the model already. But I want to show you here, the next step for the inverse design, how do you use this model to get some insights and guide your experiment? Okay, so we create this model and then we can use this model to generate random examples. And because I know my actual model for this, this is just like a trick because this, this one, I know my kinetics of the model, so I can generate some actual model to compare what is the MSE between my model and the actual concentration. So this is also very good. So this is a testing data set. It's like purely from the model. If you recall from the first, from Qian Xiao introduced to you, what's the training data set, validation data set, and test data set to tell you how good my model is. But also I got the actual real world data. So I'm able to compare my model with the real physical laws. So the results are still satisfactory. So these are not necessary steps, just to show you how, do you, how can you showcase my model is good. You can use this comparison. And then I want to generate more examples and print my output to, to Excel file. So I'm able to see if I can get more conditions and meet my requirement. So here we just, the following step, just to we, we print, more mod, print more data points using my model and then write them to this gen Excel file, okay? So this file is written in this way that it's just some structure you can, every time when you run the model, it will create another sheet for you. So how, how this is defined is you still have your F1 to F3 as your features. So if you recall the reaction, it's a CA0 concentration, second is a time, third is a temperature. So this is input and you have your predicted value here. And because we also have our actual, actual age, this is the real result. But normally if you got the, the unknown complex experiment, you don't have this actual result. You only have this generated, the first three as your input and the five as your generated concentration. Okay. So you can play some optimization here to do the inverse design, but simple way if you just you can do something in Excel, I just want a filter, so I can just design a filter in my certain column. Okay, I know the uh, P5 is my fi final product, so I want my P5 to be larger than something, to be greater than, than one. And then I can get these conditions. If I want to get further, I can get some satisfied conditions. And based on this, you, you screened all those necessary conditions. You know these are the input to design the experiment. Okay, so this is just a simplified, like, like, the, uh, stu uh, like the human way to do the optimization instead of the computer way. <laughs> but you can use this to do the inverse design as well. So this basically explains how the, this code gives you the functionality. It's quite simple, but I think it gives some functions to help you to use new network and design certain conditions to train your model. Okay, is this clear to everyone? Okay, you can play with more complex data, no problem. But I just give you some examples here. So I want to show our model is quite accurate, it's not bad. So you can apply this to all different types of models, but sometimes you suffer from the hyperparameters tuning process. Okay, so I want to show you some other content from here. Okay, so we, we put 
some other models, you have a slide, so you can see other models. It's very simple to use, but just change the name and try other more advanced model to deal with other different data set. It doesn't hurt to try and see which model gives you best performance. And we also have a second example. So he, this one we won't give, give, go through the code because you got a lot of examples as take home practice you want to play with. But I want to go through the slides to show you how we can use the time series data to, to play with, uh, to, to get some understanding with time included because we want to understand the history, how materials is synthesized. So if we have time series data, then recurrent neural network becomes a very good structure because it has a time label to deal with the sequential data and do the iterative training process. So each node still at, uh, at each time step is a deep neural network to be trained, but then gets the sequential processed data based on time steps. So this is quite a state of art result. So that gives very good results in natural language processing because when humans speak, it's not just time series data. So they use this recurrent ne neural network of how you write. The, anything about the time, about the dynamic model can be used for, can, can, can make very good results using RNN. So it just explains all different structures of RNN model. So here I also give you some examples in, I can show you later where you can find this, but I, I, if we have more time series data, we got the input which include this time step here, and you have your output, then you can still follow the same step as I introduced to you earlier to prepare your data, to save your data in Excel, and then read your data. But this time, you, you use the RNN recurrent neural network to process your data. Still, the hyperparameter you need to train it. You can use the default value as a beginning, and then build this network. So here we use TensorFlow, but this, this code I, I keep there in the folder is use another API library called tflearn instead of Keras earlier. So those, this one, just I didn't include this in the workshop environment. It's, it's initially I said, oh, I made the error, but then I realized it's a very good practice for you to see if you are able to install this, this, this library yourself. So I can show you later how you do that. So when you bring this code home, you will see error message, but then you just install this TF learn, and then you will be able to use it. It's like the real world learning how you install more and more package to use that. And then you, you see you can print results, and we can draw a lot of clouds to show the results. And here we care about MSE, we care about accuracy, but it's actually a lot of these machine learning metrics from statistics that will tell you how good your model is. So based on really your needs, a straightforward way is just to draw the figure to see the R square and MSE. But in machine learning, there's also a lot of this called false positive, negative, and S1 score record. If you're interested, you can check all those indicators to see how to use them properly. Okay, so this is a model we trained and uh, we got quite good accuracy. So that's the overall, you can play with RNN model later. And also for the base, based on the basic RNN model, we can have more different additional functions. So you can just add some options to make it more functional. So this is kind of framework at least here, how if we want to use machine learning to help us to develop the accelerated material development is really how you prepare your data. If you don't have good data, it's nothing. So we have to get our data prepared well, and then do the feature engineering to get the material descriptors, then select your machine learning tools to use the tools, and finally interpret your results. So human intelligence is still very important. Okay, so this is the slide, and uh, I think before we conclude, I also want to show you some of the take-home examples because we introduced part of the files here, but still there are several more we don't get time to introduce. So I will briefly show you some of the things you can play with. So this is a new network. I, I show you the, the DNN, but in the backup case study, it has a lot of CNN model and uh, some other case, some other data sites are in the model. So if you want to play with the same data site, this diamond reaction, you go into it and you are able to see this. Either use CNN or RNN, you can open it and run. I'll show you an error message. Oh, I installed the package already, so I can run it here. But if you see an error message of TF learn not recognized or something, you can then just use this basic thing 
count the install pay first and then pay install tfdern. This tfdern is a package. You can install other packages in your Anaconda prompt. So therefore, you can just use a lot, tons of these nice environments and package at your choice. Okay. So this is what I have for for days for new network. But my colleague, uh, the colleague Samisa, before she also introduced a case study, but she also prepared some very nice code here. You can also play with later. It's the VAE variation autoencoder based on the same reaction data site and also clustering. So this is unsupervised learning, actually. If you want to get a sense of what this can be, so you can go to the clustering folder and say the autoencoder, the k-means. So all those are the nice, commonly used unsupervised learning methods. If you are really keen to learn, we can even have a workshop 2.0. <laughs> OK. All right, so that's a part of the new network. And I hope you enjoyed and learned a little bit. Thank you.